Um, a little bit about myself, I'm Director of Data Innovations. The title is uh, a little odd. Uh, it leads a lot of people thinking that we're talking about big data, but in fact, um, what we're trying to do with the Data Innovations team is uh, promote next generation integration solutions like uh, web services. And that's how we're here to talk to you today. A um, little bit about HCA before we go on. Um, we are a very large hospital provider um, in the United States and also a few facilities in the UK around the London area. You can see there on the map. Um, we have 186 hospitals and more than 2000 uh, sites of care, as it mentions here. Um, we also, uh, our numbers from last year, some stats from last year, 2019, we had 35 million patient encounters, 9.2 million ER visits. I mean, you can read the slide. Um, you get the idea that we uh, do everything at a very large scale and uh, HCA is successful at scale. Um, we also have um, some of the challenges that were mentioned earlier today about different uh, groups within the organization. Uh, we definitely have that as well. We have a corporate IT office. That's one I work for here in Nashville, Tennessee. But we also have 15 division level de IT departments spread around the country. And we have um, other businesses we own and operate that have their own IT departments as well, such as Sarah Cannon Cancer Research Center, uh, Paralon and Sarah Core provide business services, backend billing, all kinds of um, patient uh, accounting activities, as well as uh, staff augmentation and other things for us. And our health trust supply chain, one of the bigger uh, health purchasing groups in the country. And so uh, all these different departments have different needs for data and uh, oftentimes come to us in search of that data as the integration team. We also have many uh, source systems. So um, we have 186 uh, locations in those uh, uh, hospitals, I'm sorry, and the uh, 2000 other locations and combined their service by at least five different EMR systems and hundreds of vendor products. So we have a lot of systems running around out there producing data and consuming data. And from an integration standpoint, from what our department does, um, we move about 250 million transactions a day now. Uh, I've been with HCA for about five years. That number was less than 100 million when I joined. Uh, similarly, we have, we're tracking about 90,000 total um, HL7 interfaces, total HL7 sockets. And um, again, when I joined, that was about 45,000. So we continue to grow at a, at a pretty tremendous rate in terms of moving data around the organization. Uh, to help us with that, we've got both Cloverleaf and BizTalk interface engines, and we've got multiple data solutions, including traditional data warehousing solutions. We've got Hadoop, we've got SQL and NoSQL engines, we've got queuing engines now. Uh, those were just starting to come into the organization when I joined HCA five years ago. So we have a lot of systems out there and a lot of ways of moving data. But with all of that, we still didn't have any enterprise SOA. So when I joined five years ago, um, there were some development teams who were just starting to build applications and they had built some REST APIs specifically for their applications, but we didn't have an enterprise SOA architecture. We didn't have a single place to go for kind of when you start a new application, where do you go for the data? You kind of start here in the enterprise SOA. And if that doesn't suit your needs for whatever reason, then we have other channels to deliver other types of data to you. And that's largely because HCA has been a, traditionally been a buy and implement shop, but that's changing. We are becoming more and more a development shop. And so development teams are growing up in all of these organizations, both at corporate, at those divisions I mentioned, as well as our um, uh, partner organizations, they're sprouting up in all the different organizations. And so the demand for consistent data um, and easy to access data is growing and growing. So um, as these uh, start to uh, sprout up, uh, traditionally um, the, the project would start with a, what I call a game of where's the data. They would have to shop around the organization to ask, well, who's got the source for this data element I need or these data elements? And sometimes it would get multiple answers from different groups. There'd be um, a lot of overlap, but 
in name only. Once you started getting down to the data element level, you find out just how well they actually overlap and what the consistency is between all those systems. So it's a very complicated landscape and, and not easy to navigate to get the data you needed for your development project. So um, to, to kind of illustrate that problem a little bit, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the uh, healthcare landscape, we're going to do a really quick scenario to kind of illustrate uh, what you were facing as, an, as a developer um, to build an application. So uh, the scenario we're, we're talking about here is one that's very, very simple, especially if you're in healthcare, you definitely understand this um, because almost every application starts with, hey, I need basic information about the patient. I need to know who's in our beds. And so we're going to build a bed board here and we're going to say, I want to know the patient's name, the patient's location, meaning their room and their bed. And I want to display that on a screen. And uh, so I've got a web page maybe that refreshes every five minutes and displays all that information. Of course, patients are moving in and out of beds all the time. They're coming in and out of the hospital all the time, especially during business hours. Um, so this is constantly changing. So you do have to go back and requery your source consist, uh, constantly. So here's our application um, and it wants to know where the patients are. And for the majority of our facilities at HCA, that data is in Meditech. Meditech is our primary EMR, but as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's only one of five, but it is the primary one. And uh, in a healthcare environment, you would get that data traditionally from um, and what they call an ADT feed. ADT stands for Admit, Discharge and Transfer. And the data in there is the basic information about the patient. So when the patient moves rooms, a new record is admitted that has that new room, room and bed location on it. When the patient's admitted, discharged, et cetera, you get new records. And those are fed over a TCP socket. So those are not coming via HTTP. They're not coming over a protocol. You might recognize it, it has its own wire protocol as well called MLLP. So we have um, specific products to uh, help us uh, manage that data flow, okay? And these are optimized for flow, um, getting the data in and out from the source, like Meditech, to the destinations wherever they need to go. So this uh, Cloverleaf system in the middle, our Cloverleaf interface engine is, um, uh, we have the biggest Cloverleaf installation in the world. Uh, WSO2 also has products that compete in the same space. So um, you can check out their website uh, to see about those integration solutions, but we've had Cloverleaf for over 20 years. So uh, we've been a long time Cloverleaf shop. So, um, so our integration team would create a new connection in Cloverleaf and we would create a copy of that data to send to you, to your application. And so now you have to find a way to catch that data. So you would build an interface or some kind of piece of software. Again, you could use another interface engine here if you wanted to, but that's just adding to your expense and complexity sometimes if that's not your main goal, right? Your main goal is I wanna build this dashboard. I don't wanna be an integration shop, um, but you're gonna to have to get this data. You're gonna to have to receive it. You're gonna to have to process it and you're gonna to have to put it in your database. So every record that comes in, you get the patient's name, you get their location, you update the database so that the patients are being tracked. And now the uh, application, the web page can query the database, get the patients out that are currently in the beds and show them on the screen. So we're, we're done here. So that's, that's the basic flow. Meditech sends the HL7 data out, goes to Cloverleaf, Cloverleaf sends a copy of that to the application. The application parses that data, stores it in the database, and now the screen can display it. Now we wanna expand to four more locations which is not an uncommon uh, thing at uh, HCA. Again, uh, you may build a uh, dashboard like this for your hospital, but then uh, you're asked to expand to the division level, um, which may have five hospitals or 10 hospitals, and all of a sudden you need to get a lot more data. And so that looks like this, of course. Um, again, integration can hook all these up, but now you're starting to get under more and more load. And now that interface engine might not be such a bad way to handle the load that you're getting uh, here in, uh, in the system. Um, and of course at HCA, we don't have just five facilities. We've got 180 some. And so it looks like this. And all of a sudden we're getting 180 of these connections and a million messages a day. And all of a sudden you have a very, very big integration problem just so that you can display um, a page 
with the patient's information, uh, their name, their unit number, room and bed at any given facility. And so the, the problem just escalates. And this is a, a very simple example, of course, but at corporate um, and, and here in Nashville, um, this is a very common problem. We, we want to be able to build an application that spans our entire organization. We don't want to build an application just for one or just for one division. We want to be able to build it and share it across all of our facilities. And we could use queuing to help with this, obviously. Uh, and in some cases we did, but you still have some kind of process here that you're going to be responsible for, some stream process that's going to pluck things off the queue, process them into your database. So that's still in uh, a lot of work to do. Um, and when you think about the, the case here, um, oftentimes the application is not wanting to access all patients. We'll see that in just a second. Um, so overall, drawbacks to this uh, solution is it's really not scalable. We're asking a lot of our development teams. It's costly in several different ways, costly to them, costly to our department, where we keep having to add more cloverleaf nodes, more uh, capacity to our cloverleaf systems and, and monitor and maintain more and more copies of this data as it moves through the organization. And then you're, you're facing future data quality issues where every application, depending on how they've um, process this data and how many fields they've kept and how they've processed that into their database, they're going to have potentially different takes on that data. Um, and then you've got the NAT straining problem. And this is what I was uh, referring to a moment ago where um, we've seen where uh, organizations do some flavor of this or this. And um, you talk to them and find out that, well, this application has a, the first step of using that application has a form on it and you put the patient's last name, first name, date of birth and gender in there. And then it searches the database to find that one patient. And you find out that their load is maybe a hundred patients a day. So now they're processing a million transactions a day so that they can work with 100 patients a day. And that's a lot of work for them to do to get at just those 100 patients that they need. So if we rewound this and said, hey, what would this look like with a service-oriented architecture in place? It would look more like this where, uh, and this is where, what we did. Um, we have the 180 connections coming into our fire encounter service. The fire encounter service saves that data once in our database and makes it available via an API, via REST API. Fire is, is simply a REST API standard for healthcare. Um, it is, um, a, it employs all the standard REST, um, um, uh, I can't call them standards, but they're de, de facto standards. Uh, you use a get operation to retrieve a record. You use a get operation to query the database and retrieve a, a record set. You can use put to update data and post to create data. Um, and the, the data format is uh, by default JSON. However, you can get it in XML flavor too, if you like. Via the standard, there's a there's a little flag you can set that says, please send me XML instead of JSON. Um, but bottom line is uh, now this application via one connection into the fire service can query for the patients they're looking for and display those on the screen. So in the case of the dashboard, they could say, hey, give me all the patients that are currently admitted at a particular facility or at multiple facilities or all facilities, depending on what it wanted to show on the screen. Similarly, the other application I hinted at that was gathering all this data just to access a small, relatively small number of patients, uh, they can go directly to that one patient's record. And so now they're relieved of that burden of having to process all of these transactions, maintain support and so on, all of that, all of that data flow. And we're storing it once and making it reusable. So now multiple applications, of course, can take advantage of this and, and um, use that same data for different purposes. Um, and they, again, they get what they need when they need it on demand. So when we started down this path, uh, it was somewhere in the 2016, 2017 timeframe, uh, we started with one consumer um, that was coming to us asking for patient data. We had one facility we loaded, so kind of started small, piloted it at one facility. 
Uh, we just built that one fire service, the encounter service. Uh, we had one application server and one standalone uh, uh, WSO2 API gateway. Um, and that service only served up a subset of the data at that time. So it only served up a, a small number of fields um, and about 5,000 messages a day were coming in from that facility, getting processed, stored in our database. Um, and uh, we were getting hundreds of calls from the other end, from the application end. So it looked something like this. And then from there, we expanded out and started adding additional facilities, additional environments, additional custom consumers started to come along as uh, another application would pop up needing similar data. And we say, hey, we've got this thing over here. You know, we can share it with you and we can start building upon what we had uh, originally built. So um, we now, over time, have added hundreds of fields to this service. It is by far the most complicated service we've got, the encounter service. Uh, there is a lot of data crammed into that encounter um, for all kinds of purposes. Um, uh, just as one example, uh, we got a request this morning to add some additional fields to cover COVID type situations, right? Um, where we wanna start tracking uh, the questions that were asked to the patient when they walked in our door. Have you been uh, overseas lately? Do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Those kind of things, they're recorded in this uh, encounter service. And so um, the, the number of fields we've been storing in that service have expanded greatly over time. But at the same time, the consumer, the original consumer we had was not affected. They did not have to recompile their code as we added fields, they didn't, they didn't even know it was going on. We were testing with them in QA, but uh, they didn't have to touch any of their code. And the reason for that is that the fire standard has a home for different data elements. And so over time, as we're adding more elements, we're putting them in those homes. And the API, uh, the SDK that uh, is available for um, fire in .NET knows where all those homes are. And so as you build your application, you're using that uh, SDK, all of those fields are available to your SDK. So today, when you retrieve a record, it may have hundreds of fields on it. Tomorrow we may add more fields and those just slot into the places that the SDK is already aware of and it just happily takes on and, and keeps going. Meanwhile, you're pulling just the fields you need from that SDK. And so the data you rely on is there but the new fields are also there if you wanna start taking advantage of them. Um, we've also added bi-directional support. So now we can not only read the data out of this encounter service, but we can write it back too. So now we can start to build applications that allow um, HCA development teams to edit patients' records, which comes in very handy uh, for our Paralon business partners who are using this for patient accounting and can provide a much smoother experience for our patients and through the billing process. We've got about uh, 180 Meditech 5.6 facilities integrated now, and they're sending approximately a million messages a day. It fluctuates from 800,000 to a million in there. Uh, and there's about 36 million encounters in the database now, um, going back two and a half, three years, whatever it was. Um, so that looks like this now where we've got 180 connections coming from all of those facilities. And we have 180 connections going back to all of those facilities. So now we have 360 connections that we're hiding behind the scenes here while the, oops, sorry, while the uh, consumer application is none the wiser, they just continue to have their one connection. And of course that's fronted by the um, WSO2 API uh, gateway product, the APIM, um, which is, uh, brokering all of the security and, and managing all of the um, connectivity through to these backend services. Each of these services too is a microservice. So um, this little brown box here um, is a standalone C-sharp um, uh, .NET uh, web API. And we can deploy that into as many servers as we need to, or ultimately in the future, we can start deploying them to containers. We're not in a containerized in environment right now, um, but uh, that's certainly a possibility as we grow, we'll be able to um, grow uh, our, our services uh, appropriately. So if you fast forward all the way to today, in addition to how we grew that one service from one facility 
to 180 facilities and from a small amount of data to a very large volume of data. Um, we've also added uh, a lot more to our program. So if you start to look at the, the program overall, um, infrastructure wise, we now have four environments. The dev environment we use just for our developers to make sure that things are working before they promote it up to the QA environment. Uh, QA is where uh, all our testing is done. Staging is a duplicate of production that's pointed at QA data sources. So that as our consumers on the other side of this uh, connection want to test their changes, but they want to test it against the same version we have in production, because QA is one step ahead. So QA is production plus. Um, stay, they can go to the staging environment and test their application changes against our existing version, uh, our existing production version, but without the danger of uh, interacting with production data, which of course in, in healthcare is so, uh, something we need to be very careful of. Um, we use a couch-based NoSQL for the majority of our data store, although in a, in a second you'll see um, we have additional data sources that we pull from. Um, we have about 15 different services and they work as an ecosystem. So each type of object may or usually does link to other types of objects. So uh, the encounter uh, links back to the patient object. And so we can get from the encounter to the patient, we can get from the encounter to the location that the patient was being treated at. And each of those are separate services. So there's a patient service that serves up patients. There's an encounter service that serves up encounters. There's a location service that serves up treatment locations. Um, we also have a um, order service that um, references back to the encounter. So this ecosystem um, of different objects all point to each other and uh, work as, as, as one whole ecosystem. So they're not just standalone services serving a vertical of data. They cross cut horizontally as well. Uh, we got about four or five bi-directional uh, interfaces. Uh, so those are the ones that are both able to serve up the data as well as allow users to edit the data and affect that edit back in the source EMRs. Uh, and we're getting up to about 70 million total API calls per month now. Um, that's what our numbers were in July. Um, that includes us calling ourselves. So um, fire services during processing in the workflow um, frequently need to call themselves, call other services in the ecosystem. Um, and when they do, of course, that adds load to our um, internal API, um, in sorry, on our um, API gateway. So we're looking at ways that we can optimize that, but total call volume is about 70 million now. Uh, we have 23 consumers um, in various different buckets. So in addition to just applications, we have um, healthcare practices and vendor integrations going on. So our total ecosystem is starting to look like this now. Uh, I didn't show all of the fire services here. I've only highlighted a few of the, the more prominent ones, but on the uh, right-hand side here, or sorry, left-hand side here, we have the uh, different classifications of consumers. So we have the applications that we originally targeted, which were intern typically internally built applications. Um, so these are HCA developers wanting to access data to um, make our business more efficient. But then we're starting to integrate with some vendor systems as well. Um, vendor systems we've purchased and they have made hints that they're capable of doing fire and have fire integration capabilities. And so we've talked to some of them and found out that, hey, it would be really great if we could use fire uh, in this integration. And then we don't have to receive 180 connections from you to get the data we need. We can just go ask for what we need. And then 30 third party practices, um, we don't employ any radiologists at HCA, that business, we partner with local uh, radiology groups. So they're a great example of um, uh, a third party practice that needs to be able to access uh, patients that um, have received the diagnostic imaging of one kind or another. So you go in and get your foot x-rayed and the physician that, that reads that is coming from one of these third party practices. They will sit down, read that um, image, diagnose it. That information needs to find its way back into uh, our systems. Um, and that is in some cases being uh, enabled through um, the fire services. On the other end of um, 
uh, the diagram here on the right hand side, we've also got different classifications now of sources of data. So in addition to those Meditech facilities that we originally integrated with, we've also integrated with our electronic master patient index. It's very similar to uh, a uh, talk uh, earlier today uh, about the um, consumer ID management. You have the very same problem with patients in healthcare. Um, it's hard sometimes to know that these two people are in fact the same person. And that's what an EMPI system does is it takes the uh, demographic di information for these two patients and says, oh, I've got a record here that says Tim Dunnington lives in Nashville. And I got another one over here that says Timothy Dunnington also lives in Nashville and have the same birth date. Those are probably the same people. We're going to link those two records together. Uh, we surface that through uh, our patient service, as well as our practitioner service, we use an EMPI to match our physicians. We've got, as we mentioned um, in way back in the first slide, uh, we have like uh, tens of thousands of employed physicians. And so uh, we need to be able to um, recognize that this physician at these three or four different hospitals are actually the same guy. And then uh, finally, we've got our data store in Couchbase, which is a uh, NoSQL database that's storing our fire data in J JSON format. So as we bring the data in from these different sources, we'll turn it into JSON in fire format, store it in the Couchbase database. It indexes those JSON fields and allows us to query across those objects and pull them back right in native fire format in essence. And some of these use cases, uh, I mentioned the radiology provider integration, um, which uh, in, we also have another radiology provider that's actually treating our patients in our facility. So they've kind of outsourced the business um, at our facility and uh, they can do an entire patient workflow. So they can register the patient through our services. They can create orders for those patients and they can fulfill those orders for those patients. So they have their own set of systems in their own data center in a different state and they're treating the patient through those systems. And then they're coordinating all of that data back to us um, via fire services. Um, uh, we have a phone system vendor that's using the encounter service to retrieve all of the patients that are at a particular location, what bed they're in, so that when family come to visit, they can pull it up and say, oh, Tim Dunnington's in room you know, 12, whatever. Um, or if the patient call, uh, patient's family calls in and says, hey, I'm trying to find Tim Dunnington, you can look it up uh, through our fire service and get the phone number of that patient's bed and call directly into the patient's room. And then we have a couple of internal applications that are being widely used in, um, in again, with our Paralon uh, partners that are using um, it to curate insurance and billing information. But we also hook into our patient portal. So if you go to our patient portal called My Health One, you can register yourself for an upcoming visit, uh, or you can fill out a pre-surgical questionnaire in some cases. There's limited uses, but it's, it's growing. Um, you can go into that uh, portal, and um, when you execute those activities, they are eventually getting a, a call into our fire service to put that data back into Meditech so that when you show up at the facility, your data is there in the Meditech system and the, page, uh, the, the nurse can pull it up and, and um, see what you entered in the uh, My Health One portal. And looking into the future, um, of course, I made mention of the additional EMRs. We're gonna wanna pull that data in, but we're also gonna wanna start normalizing this data in two different ways. One is we wanna make the format the same so that as you're building an application, you can surface and show patient information from all these other EMRs in one format. You only have to know the patient's name is in one place, the patient's address is in one place and so on. So we'll, we'll ensure that those data are normalized into one format and your application only has to worry about one format of data. Uh, but on top of that, there's a code normalization problem as well. Um, each of those 180 facilities has a different code for let's say COVID. So for COVID test results, um, we have dozens and dozens of different ways that those have been set up in those 180 facilities. And we um, can normalize those through these code normalization services. 
we can also not just normalize them to an HCA standard. So maybe we recognize that COVID-19 and COVID are both the same test. And we say, well, they're both COVID and we're just gonna call it COVID. We could do that. We could also raise it to uh, low ink standards, which is an international standard for uh, lab uh, codes. And so we could put the low ink codes on there as well. And now it's recognized internationally. So when other systems are looking at our data, uh, they can see that, well, you know, one of HCA's facilities calls it just COVID, but here's the low ink code. And that's mapped to an international standard that I could recognize in any system. And so that ecosystem um, starts to pull in additional data sources on the right hand side. And now we've gone from systems to whole classifications of systems in these boxes. We have EMRs, homegrown systems that are starting to supply data into the services as well as consume data. So we have a, a homegrown application that is consuming our services to do some work and then is publishing data back into another service that they built on their own and is fronted through the same gateway. And so now they've joined the ecosystem by being both a consumer and a producer of fire data. Uh, we've got master data management systems that are coming in to help us manage places, um, treatment locations, for example. Um, we have, you know, 2,200 treatment locations and it gets complicated keeping all those addresses, phone numbers, names, uh, identifiers. You'd be surprised <laughs> how complicated that is. So we've got master data management systems starting to come in to manage those, as well as code, sys uh, code set management systems um, that are helping us map codes like COVID that I uh, just mentioned um, into national standards so that we can start to surface that data in a standard way. But those are, those are some of the future things we're looking to do to make it more and more uh, straightforward and easy for our consumers out here to access our services. Um, and with WSO2, we have a, a, in our production environment, we have a four node cluster that has two API management nodes, two analytics nodes, um, as well as fronts this store. So we have a common storefront that's also been mentioned a couple times today. Uh, we have a storefront that our users can come to. They can look up our um, services and um, subscribe to those very, very quickly through that, um, through that API and through that uh, uh, website. So um, I hope uh, I, I covered <laughs> the basics here of our journey from starting very small of one uh, little service serving one small application and getting to where we are today, where we have many classes of applications and many classes of data being served um, through our fire services. And I thank you.